My name is Scott Ketty. I'm principal brewer and one of the owners of Three Dogs Brewing here in White Rock, BC. We saw a need and an opportunity for a small brewery in White Rock. We weren't looking for anything too massive. We weren't trying to compete with the big boys. We were looking for something that was very community oriented, that was inviting for the community that they could come in, have a beer, play some games, socialize, have it as a community space. So we started looking into it about a year ago and that was the looking into the legislation, what it would take to open a brewery here in White Rock and, and going through the process. And we found out it was, first of all, doable for, for someone of our means. We didn't want to get into it too deeply, too financially heavily. We both love beer. I've been brewing non-professionally for, for quite a while with a brew house system in, in my basement that I turned into a small microbrewery. When we were looking for systems to homebrew with, we didn't want to do it with buckets and carboys and just play at it. We wanted to do some quality beers and I looked at various systems and we settled on the brew house system. And I reached out to Nathan, the owner, and he was so helpful in, in getting us off on the right foot. Our friends were coming by and they're tasting your beer and they were liking it and saying, well, you should be uh, selling beer. Well, selling beer is is a whole different story. So we kind of pushed back on that. But we did start to go into brew competitions with, uh, with our home system beer. And we did quite well. A long story short, I'll just jump ahead a little bit. We were looking for a lifestyle business here in White Rock. And people said, well, you're retiring, you make beer, we like your beer, sell beer. In September of last year, we started the process. And that was the process of incorporating a company, starting the paperwork with the liquor board, and uh, looking for a space. Now, when we were looking for a space, we were looking for something very specific. We didn't want to get into a big uh, industrial area. It was difficult for people to get to because we were looking for a local business. It had to be basically a retail location. We looked into a few in the area, settled on this one, uh, suited our needs. It was a former wine store, and we're about 1,600 square feet here. Went to an architect who drew up some preliminary plans, some floor plans, gave us some occupancy loads. We finally got to the point where we secured the space, had the wheels in motion with the city and the liquor control board. We took possession of this space just after Christmas of last year. So we started renovations in January. Come July, we started uh, brewing. A little bit behind schedule, but in reality, probably real, more realistic. We opened our doors end of August. We're now here six or seven weeks in, and the response has been overwhelming. This is the five barrel Bruja system that uh, we went with. It was the largest system that Nathan and Bruja had at the time. It works for us perfectly because of its uh, flexibility and its portability. We have a very small brew space in here. I mean, our whole brewery is crammed into 1,600 square feet, and that includes the tasting room, the bar serving area, the milling area in the back and our brewery area. Our brewery here actually is about 500 square feet. Trying to do 30 barrels of beer in 300 square feet for a typical system would be impossible with a fixed standard mass tune boil kettle. It would take up half the real estate we, we have available. This system allows us to move the tanks into our brewing area, brew, clean, do whatever we need to, and then move them back into a small area close together where they can ferment and then we can move them around to, to fill kegs. Uh, basically, it's, uh, it's always on the move. The, the steps are all the same. You grind the grain, you mash, you lauder, you boil, you ferment. The approaches are different, though, in the equipment that, are, that you can use. That's going to give you varying results. The BX system allowed us from the get-go in a very small footprint, a very economical size package to control all the aspects of the brew, which gives you such consistent results. Everything matters when you're making beer. Everything from the size of the, the, the grain uh, grist that you're milling to, the, the water temperatures, the type of yeast, the temperatures you're fermenting at, the temperatures you're, how fast you can cool the wort, everything matters. So the more you can control each aspect of it, the better results and more consistent results you're going to get. The BX system right from the get-go allowed us to control all those aspects very carefully. Someone starting with the BX system could start on a larger system. It would benefit them to, to have a little more experience with a smaller system, but not required. Certainly I would recommend someone starting with a larger system come and, come and visit us, for example. Do a couple of brews with us and see how we do it. 
what some of the, the techniques that we use and how we use the, use the equipment. How we use the equipment on the big or the small is almost exactly the same. There's a few minor differences that uh, we used to make the brewing with the bigger system a little more ec economical in terms of time for us, in terms of we use an external wort chiller, not required, but we do. We use a slightly larger pump than you might use at home, but fundamentally the techniques and the processes with the BX system is, is the same for the small all the way up to the, the five hectoliter system. Our brewery, it's quite open. From the seating side, we're open right into our brew side. So we're always working in here when, when it's open and we get a lot of comments from our guests that they really like being, they feel like they're part of the process. Things are always moving, things are always changing, things are always in motion. They really get to see the process, be part of it, and, and see where the, their beer is coming from. It's not hidden away in a room somewhere. It's, it's right in the midst of, of the whole, uh, whole brewery. When we took the space over, it had a false ceiling in here. It had a, had a drop, T-bar drop ceiling that we wanted to get rid of. Two reasons, one, we needed the, the height and we also didn't like the look of the white tile ceiling. So we tore the ceiling out, we uh, painted everything black, we put in track lighting. Building the bars, we built the cooler, had to build a walk-in cooler behind us here. To keep our beer cold, we decided that we were gonna serve right from our cooler. So we designed it so we don't have long beer lines. As far as ventilation, we didn't do any modifications to the ventilation in here, and we didn't put in any floor drains. Because the BIAC system is, is, is very portable and manageable, we don't have the same problems that a larger brewery has where they're dumping stuff onto the floor and, and making a lot of use of floor drains. Any little spills that we do get, we just pick it up with a shop vac and carry on. In terms of other modifications, we had to make some plumbing modifications to increase the water supply to the brew side. So it's an inch and a half system and it drops down to three quarter, to one inch and three quarters as it gets here. We run three quarter inch through a, a backflow device into a, a filtration system and we use a three cartridge fil uh, filtration system to remove uh, sediment, uh, chlorines and, and metals. We were fortunate when we came in here, we had a, a lot of power already. We have two uh, 225 amp panels, which more than uh, supplied our needs and there are three phase panels. Uh, the nice thing about the BX system, it's adaptable to single phase or three phase. We went the three phase simply because it's a little more flexible in terms of uh, power requirements. Uh, we use a little less power than we would with a single phase, but certainly doable with a single phase panel. As far as any other renovations in here, we uh, put in a bathroom. Uh, we had to, one of the requirements of the city was that we have two handicap accessible washrooms. So we had to add another. Other than that, as far as uh, the bar furnishings and everything else, we built a lot of the sinks and uh, the stainless steel you'll see behind me here in our brew area, we got used. Uh, we picked up used at uh, restaurant auctions. We just watched the local auctions and save some money that way. Typical brew day for us starts with two things. First, we start filling the vessel. Because our, our, our flow is, is slow through the filters because we're treating it through three stages, it probably takes us several hours to fill up a tank. So we'll get that started the day before. Start bringing up temperature to our, strike, our initial strike temperature. Uh, at the same time, while that's filling, we're off on, in the back milling, milling the grain. Uh, we have a small mill, we mill everything right here on site. Uh, and we just mill it right back into grain bags and we'll bring it out here. We'll fill up the mash colander with about half of the, uh, the grain. We'll pull the lid off of the fermenter here and drop the grain in, add the rest of the grain and then start the mashing process, the laudering. We'll mash for whatever the recipe calls for, usually somewhere in the neighborhood of an hour, an hour and a half, watching our gravities all the time. Once we've hit our, our time or, or the gravity we're looking for, we'll start to pull the grain out. Uh, we use the overhead gantry here and we just simply raise the mash colander right out of the grain and watching our levels, our water levels, so we're not exposing any elements, and start to sparge. We'll use, uh, we use a separate uh, hot liquor tank to supply the water for the sparge. Uh, we'll sparge to the, the level or the gravity or what the recipe calls for and then remove the grain entirely. We've made arrangement with a local farmer. All our spent grains go to feed his cows. We just simply put the spent grain into several bins and send him a text message and he comes by, picks it up and feeds it to his cows. We're kind of happy that we're not just throwing that into a landfill. 
Ceiling height for the BX system is something to consider only because we need to raise the mash colander clear of the vessel. We have a very low ceiling height in here. I think our, our ceiling height here is just shy of 11 feet. Now, when we were considering the BX system for this space, we, we went back and forth with the specs to make sure that we could fit it in. This ceiling height just works. Uh, we, were, we were able to source a gantry and a low profile headroom crane that worked. Certainly a higher ceiling makes it a little easier, but it certainly can be done in, in a small, low ceiling height. After we've, we've removed the grain and, and dumped the grain, we, we get the, the mash colander out of the brewer area. Then we start to bring it up to boil with our controller. Boiling obviously creates steam. Steam is not a problem for us because we didn't actually make any modifications to the ventilation in here. We don't have a big steam collection vent. What we do is we have a 1500 cubic foot per minute blower that we use the actual top of the vessel and we put on an elbow with a flexible hose, goes off to a blower that we, re we push the air back into the air conditioning system and use the dehumidification properties of the air conditioning system to remove most of the steam. Our uh, ambient humidity level in here is probably we run it around 45 to 50 percent. So on brew day, uh, a lot of that steam just goes into the atmosphere and it'll bring up the ambient humidity in here to about 70 percent and the rest is taken care of by the air conditioner. So we didn't have to make any major ventilation modifications uh, for, the, for the brewing, which saved uh, just a, a fabulous amount of time and effort and money, not to mention mechanical costs and inspections and everything else. Hop additions, obviously we make hop additions depending on the recipe at different stages in the brew process. We use a hop spider. Hop spider is just a name for a big basket that sits on the side of the brew vessel that we just toss our hops in. At the end of the end of the boil, while it's cooling, we add all our hops. That hop spider is just withdrawn. We let it drain very slowly and then remove it right from the vessel and all the hop debris is, is contained in that hop spider and we just dispose of it that way. It's not necessary. Uh, some breweries will just throw the hops directly into the boil and let it, let it settle out and remove it with the tube. We're a craft brewery. We don't filter our beer. We don't do anything special to it after the boil or before we, we keg it or serve it. We find that that gives us a little clearer beer. When we're using the very small BX system at home, we used to make use of the jacket on, on the outside of the vessel. When we got to the larger, the larger system, uh, we still used the, the external jacket for, for chilling, for cooling after the boil, but we also, for the last five minutes of the boil, we run an external wort chiller and we run the boiling wort through the chiller. It's already been cleaned and sanitized, but that just gives us the final sanitation, recirculating back into the, the vessel to chill down from, from a boil. We can bring it down, this five hectoliters down from a boil using the, the jacket and the wort chiller in about 45 minutes. And that's pretty quick. After the boil, what we do is, and it's chilled, we'll, we'll remove a little of the hop, the, the tube and the, the hop debris from the, from the boil. We'll oxygenate for uh, using pure oxygen for, uh, depending on, the, the volume probably be about four to five minutes. Then our pitch our yeast. It's, it's pretty straightforward. There's no real magic to it. In fact, uh, we were trying to get really fancy for a bit and use oxygenating stones and everything, but what we found actually works really well is we just hook our oxygen up to the intake of the wort chiller and we use that initial oxygen to clear the wort chiller and everything back into the vessel. So we're using the the oxygen to do some of the work of, of cleaning out that chiller. And then we just close our valves in, in, in the right order and we're pitch our yeast, put our, put our lid on, and we're ready to ferment. For temperature control of our fermentation, uh, we've gone and used the uh, Linder chiller supplied by Bruja to control our temperatures all the way through. We use it for every step, every stage of, of the brewing process, right from uh, controlling our fermentation temperatures uh, to cold crashing. And we can control that temperature within a degree all the way through the ferment process. So whether we want to raise the ferment temperature or drop it, or that will control the ferment temp and through primary, secondary, and right up until we want a cold crash. Uh, when we want a cold crash, we just drop the temperature on the 
controller and that uh, little unit goes to work and we can drop these uh, big vessels in with a small wart chiller down into the low 40s, uh, high 30s. The main reason we go with a glycol system is it required one very big unit, permanent piping, and um, given the nature of, of, of our system here and, and our footprint and how we, how we use the equipment, a, a glycol system, uh, very expensive, uh, problematic with permitting. Uh, the city would require the services of what would, would have wanted it mechanically engineered and signed off. Uh, permanent piping and installation. This little chiller for our size, um, very economical. There's no waste going down the drain. There's no contamination. There's no glycol uh, spills. There's no glycol chillers that we have to be moving around. There's no glycol lines we have to hook up. It's tap water that controls our temperature and does it as accurately and as efficiently as a glycol system. It serves our needs perfectly. As far as, as fermentation time, primary fermentation uh, typically seems to take, depending on the yeast we use and, and the gravity of the beer and everything, but primary is usually over within about four to five days. Uh, and we'll, we'll watch the, the gravities and watch our secondary, secondary fermentation. Uh, we usually, it's usually about 10, 10 to 12 days between primary and secondary uh, before we start to dry hop, if, we're, if the recipe calls for a dry hop. Uh, then we'll add our dry, hop, dry hops through the top of the, the vessel. Uh, we just use uh, cheesecloth bags. We put our suspender hops into the, into the beer with uh, cheesecloth bags uh, for, the, for our dry hopping, suspended with uh, spider wire. Spider wire is just a very strong uh, nylon filament fishing line. And we just tie them off to the side of the vessel. They go right up through the gasket. There's, it's such a fine, fine line. There's no sealing issues, and it just suspends in the, into, the, uh, into the beer. For kegging, we use um, uh, uh, the CO2, uh, CO2 to push the beer down through a, a modified uh, keg uh, coupler right into the tank. Uh, we don't filter our beer. We cold crash our beer until it's to the clarity that uh, as clear as we can get it. Uh, everything settles out. We'll pull that, hop that debris out so we've got a nice clear place to draw from and then we'll start to keg. That goes into 50 liter kegs that we take into our, into our cooler. We have a CO2 tank with a regulator and a small manifold that distributes to eight keg couplers that we can force carbonate our beer. We can control the volumes of CO2 and the pressure of the CO2 to, to carbonate those kegs. The kegs take about uh, three days to bring up to the right carbonation level, level depending, on the, uh, depending on the style of beer. And then it's ready to serve. Um, typically though, we'll have four or five kegs ahead of the one we're serving carbonated. So we have just a small little program in the back where we have uncarbonated ones, ones that are being carbonated, ones that are ready to serve, and ones that are being served. So we just manage that whole thing through the back. We don't use bright tanks. A brewery our size doesn't need a bright tank. It ties up too much real estate. A bright tank of any size is going to limit our ability to, to serve a variety of beers. We run six of these five barrel fermenters and we have right now six or seven or more beers that we can produce and have on tap for our, for our guests. We clean our own kegs right here. I have a little keg cleaning system that we've cobbled together. We pull the spears every time, inspect the kegs every time. So we, we disassemble the keg. We'll take the spear out We'll examine the inside with a flashlight. We'll rinse it with, uh, with cold water. Um, then we have used our hot liquor tank when we're cleaning kegs to push hot water through it through a CIP ball. And then we move it onto another CIP ball that sanitizes it. And then we rinse it again with hot water and then inspect it, make sure it's clean and put it back together. For serving our beers, we force carbonate the kegs and we serve directly from the kegs right through the, the cooler wall into our serving area. So our serving area backs onto the cooler. We've just sized the length of our lines to match the style of beer 
uh, just to balance the keg out and, uh, and the pressure that different styles of beers are served at. So an ale that might be served at 11 PSI will have, make sure that the line for that is probably about 10 to 12 feet long. Because we're a small lifestyle brewery, our distribution model is over the counter. We sell here in White Rock over the counter. We have a 46 seat tasting room that is open five days a week. Most of our beer is sold in pints, flights and growlers. We have two sizes of growlers. We have a one liter and a two liter growler, 12 ounce glasses, 16 ounce glasses and flights. Everything we sell is over the counter. We are, our goal when we opened this was not to take on too much. We didn't want to start having to uh, distribute to liquor stores, to other restaurants, to sell kegs. Certainly we've had a lot of inquiries, would we be able to sell kegs? But given the size and the response that we've had, we can produce at a comfortable brewing level. And, and what I mean by that is number of brews that we do a week. We end up doing about two brews a week. With that, we're able to keep pace with our sales in the tasting room. Were we to go to brewing and trying to sell kegs into restaurants, trying to can, to have outside people come in and do our canning for us to be able to distribute, our brewing investment in terms of time would go through the roof for not a lot more return. Our sales now in this retail environment are in the $300 to $350 per square foot range, which in a retail environment is pretty good. It just shows to me that there's, there's a huge demand for this type of establishment in communities.